Hey, Cliff Ravenscraft here from Podcast Answer Man, and I want to thank you for checking out this video about our origin story. When I say our, I'm talking about myself and my wife, Stephanie Ravenscraft. Stephanie and I started podcasting as a hobby about the TV show Lost back in December of 2005. And over a very brief period of time, I realized that podcasting had way more to offer than just the benefits of a hobby. And in fact, after about a year, I decided that I would like to see if it would be possible to create an online business around my podcasting efforts. And in this video, you're going to see a, a, a special recording that Stephanie and I did recently where we recaptured the story of how we went from podcasting as a hobby all the way through to creating the successful business that we have today. We not only share the very successful things, how things have turned out, but we also talk about the difficulties we had along the way. There are a couple notes I wanna share with you here at the open of this video. First and foremost, it's very long. <laughs> no, it's almost two hours. And so I know that that is a lot for a video. And if you would like to listen to this in audio form instead, I encourage you to check out episode number 500 of my podcast. You can find it at podcastanswerman.com slash 500. All right, podcastanswerman.com slash 500. So if you prefer to hear the audio instead of watching this very long video, that's fine. Also, just another quick note, and this is just my own OCD getting in the way. My wife and I had planned on creating this video production and recording it for a video here on the website at Podcast Answer Man and also on my YouTube channel and other various places where people might be interested in our origin story or our podcasting journey from hobby to full-time career. And while I knew that it was coming up, the day that we recorded this, unfortunately, I had so many projects leading right up to the moment that we hit record that I didn't take time to look at the settings on the camera that was facing towards Stephanie. And so when you see this video, you're going to see that my picture is crisp and clear, just like what you see here. But unfortunately, I didn't realize the camera settings had gotten changed until the very last moment. And... By the time we were ready to go, we actually recorded this live in front of an internet audience of people all over the world on Facebook live stream. And unfortunately, Stephanie's picture is not as clear. And that is my fault. And I figured I'd let you know ahead of time what is going on there. And that, yes, I'm quite aware that the, the production value isn't up to my own standards. But anyway, I hope that you will be encouraged and inspired by our story that it will demonstrate to you the power of podcasting for getting your message out to the world, how you can actually have a, a, an incredible positive impact and influence in other people's lives all over the world with an audio podcast. And also that it's possible if you have this desire and maybe a calling to pursue work that is meaningful, fulfilling, and something that you could do as your own business, it's possible for you to create an online business that could be something that would far exceed the dreams of what you might think that is possible today. Anyway, I'm, I've said enough. I'm going to jump right into the pre-recorded video that we did the other day where Stephanie and I were in the studio sharing how we went from hobby to full-time career. I hope you enjoy. Where you and I together can tell this story. And so I have on the screen, Stephanie, a few things here. And this is what I put in my, into my talk at Blog World. It's like how a hobby related to our favorite TV show, turned into a worldwide ministry, a massive online community, and also spun into a profitable consulting and coaching business. How tools like having a blog, an audio podcast, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and other social media networking outlets can help you build a brand without any boundaries. And the question I pose to people, have you ever wanted to make a positive change in the world with what you do, with your message? Uh, and of course, Stephanie and I are here today to share how we are doing just that through podcasting and social media. So with that being st said, Stephanie, I want to start with our backstory. And why don't you tell people when we got married and how long have we been married at this point? Um, we got married in August of 1996. We've been married for 20 years. As of today, which is, uh, we're recording this in May of 2017. 
So 20 years we have been married, which is, it seems unfathomable, but at the same time, I, it's hard to remember life without you and, and uh, certainly don't ever want to give that too much thought anyway. So okay. awesome. When I when I wrote this originally, I, I still have on my notes because I haven't had a chance to update the thing here. I know I see it for, that fourteen one, and a half years. If you would have just shown me that slide, I could have figured out the math a lot quicker <laughs> to the cruise. Oh yeah, absolutely. So anyway, we we've been married for a very long time, and in the fall of nineteen ninety six, when we got married, I had this crazy thing that that is called feeling the call to full time ministry. And Stephanie did not feel that call. I didn't. I, I just, I just didn't. Um, being in, um, being in the traditional um, Sunday morning congregational gathering that people refer to as church, um, being called to be. A leader and a minister in in that way what was not put on my life. I was called to be your wife. And so I had to support you in that, even though that's not what I was being called to do. Um, not that I was being called in a way that that pulled us in opposite directions, but that being in that limelight and being on that pedestal was not for me. Still isn't. <laughs> um and and so while you're you're embarking on this on this journey of of schooling and church board meetings and all of these things i'm just along for the ride so here's the deal stephanie like turns 18 yes and we we won't go into the backstory of this but stephanie turns 18 a week later we get married yep of course, we we had been planning that for months, but uh, nah, I was just spur the moment. <laughs> yeah, hey, let's just... get married. No, so so Stephanie had been w- married for a week, and when you and I started dating, it wasn't like ministry was something that was high on my priority list and stuff like that. In fact, I wasn't even attending a congregational gathering at that time, and you were, and I recall going to to that place with you the very first time feeling like the 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 ceiling was going to fall down on me or something right. like that cuz I had been away from that lifestyle for quite some time and in my college days they you know they were I, a little wild they were a little wild to say the very least and but when you and I started talking about getting married I said I would love to marry you but the only thing is is I feel like to be the husband that I would want to be I really feel like I need to get my life back right with God and in my experience up to that point, there was only one way that I felt that I could do that, and that is through being in a in a small group of young adults who were committed to their faith and and to a life of faith and in a small group that met together on a regular basis for accountability. And that that's an experience. That's where I first, you know, years, years, years before this, that's where I first came to to a place of faith in my own life in God. So I, I'm like, hey, I, I want to marry you, but I do want to start a weekly group of people who would come together, whether in our home or someplace. Uh, back then, my only experience had been having hosting a group inside of a, a small church in, in like off hours, but just we would just gather there. Uh, but anyway, I told you, I said, I want to marry you, but are you okay with the fact that I want to be a man of faith, and I want to do this in the only way I know how at this point, and that is I want to commit myself and ourselves to being involved in relationship with other like-minded people who are pursuing a life of faith. Now, not necessarily, I'm, that, that was something that we had decided was a part well, that of was our happening. Life. That was happening before... That started before we got married. It, so yes, that's so. So Stephanie knew that that was a part, and so what happened was is we were we were routinely w- meeting together on a weekly basis. Uh, we we created this group called e- EOTC, encouraging others through Christ, and this group uh, met together on a weekly basis for month after month after month. And again, we got married in August 1996, a week after Stephanie turns 18, and then shortly after that. 
very shortly after that is when all of a sudden I'm like, wow, I feel devoted to devote my entire life to doing what we're doing in this small group here, only on a much larger scale. I feel like God's calling me to encourage others through Christ on a scale that's larger than just a small group of people here. That and and I remember um we had a what was his name? The guy that attended that local cat was his name Bill something? Mm-hmm. What was his last name? Do you remember? No, but it might come to me. Come Bill yeah. Grimm. Yes. So Bill Grimm came to me the very fir- I think it was the first time I ever attended the church you were attending at the time. And it was. It was your very first it was the very first morning that you went with me. Yeah. And so he comes up to me, he says, Hey, I don't know who you are, but I saw you walk in with Stephanie. <laughs> and I'm like, Okay. He goes, and 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 he played the bass guitar in the worship band or whatever. And he says, While I was up there playing the guitar, I saw you and God told me to come give you a message. And I'm like, Oh great, he's one of those kind of guys. <laughs> and um Anyway, he says, Cliff, I got to, he did, he asked me what my name was. He says, Cliff, I got to tell you something. And he says, God's already told me to tell you that he, he's already told me you're going to think I'm crazy. And I'm okay with that. That's not the point. But what I want to tell you is that God wants me to tell you that one day you're, you are going to be involved in ministry full time and you're going to, your ministry will reach tens of thousands of people and beyond. And I'm like, dude, you have no idea how crazy I think you are, first and foremost, uh, that God told you to give me a message. That, that was a little freaky coming from my Nazarene slash Baptist slash Methodist background growing up. Um, I've heard about people like you. I, I didn't say all of those things, but I'm thanking them, right? So first of all, I think you're crazy for that. And then number two, if you only knew where I was right now, you would know that that is the craziest thing. Um, I, we're lucky that, that lightning has not struck this building because I, well, I walked into it. Um, but he, he says, he goes, I know that you're going to think I'm but this is what God told me to tell you. And, and I kind of dismissed it. And this was way before we started that Bible study group. So, so anyway, fast forward a little bit, all of a sudden now we're having this Bible study group. We're meeting together on a weekly basis. We get married and then all of a sudden, I feel this call. And the, that little tiny message back there of what Bill Grimm said kind of tweaked me. I'm like, but I still, it's like, we were, we were attending a Nazarene church at the, at the time. And when it comes to mega churches, if you look in the Nazarene church, a mega church is like 200. Right. <laughs> 200 people. So this idea of tens of thousands, whatever, that, that seems ridiculous. But I went to our church board, I went to our pastor, and I said, I, I'm feeling this call. And he's like, yeah, yeah, we can confirm. This is definitely God's calling for you. to. Dev- it's like, you know, we, hook, line, and sinker. We got another one in. We're going to have somebody else that's going to study. And and so long story short, I became a, I, I started working towards becoming a licensed minister in the Nazarene Church, and that was a part of what I was pursuing. And the thing is, is there were, when it comes to the Nazarene church background that we have, there was this really crazy expectation of holiness and sanctification, and not just for the person behind the pulpit, but his wife as well. And <laughs> yeah, Other people haven't met me. Yeah. Um, clearly. But here's one thing that I've I've held on to in the twenty years since, um, give or take. Our pastor and his wife, um, we were very close to them, and they mentored us quite a long way through that through that journey. And um, and I remember one day we were having lunch with them after Sunday service. You know, um, there we didn't have any children yet. Their boys all went off and did did other things, and um, and we went to lunch. And I remember having this conversation conversation with Keith and Marie about not being what they expect, not them as in Keith and Marie, but them as in the church as a whole. Um, I, I wasn't what they expected me to be. I wasn't what they wanted me to be. And I specifically said the words, I don't fit the mold. And Keith looked at me, and I've held these words to me my, my entire adult life, 
Keith looked at me and said, break the mold. And I've been crushing that thing every day since. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have. So, um, And you've co- co-opted me into the journey of breaking the mold. It feels good, though, doesn't it? It does. Oh, my goodness. The was freedom. A mold, the mold needed to be broken. Let me tell you. The freedom from breaking the mold is just um, indescribable. Yeah. Indescribable. Well, we, we pursued ministry for years beyond that. Actually, for 10 years, I was involved in an official ministry capacity within a local congregational gathering. And, and for, so from 1996 all the way, I think it was through 2006, and might have even been 2007. But anyway, we'll get into that later. So we, Stephanie's 18, she turns 18. Week later, we get married. A couple weeks later, I'm like, hey, I want to be a full-time minister. Dude, not, not, now I'm a preacher's wife? I don't think so. <laughs> exactly. And then if that's not crazy enough, you know, here I am. I think at the time, was I still working at Staples? Is that where I was working? Um, or was I working at the sign shop? I can't remember. No, I think when we first got married, you were you were at Staples. Okay. Um, I think you started um, working for your parents in December of that year. It was. It we was were married December in August, two- and in December, um, you started working. So in the... In that in between, between August and December, you worked for Staples. Yeah, so I was still working at the call center for Staples. If you placed a catalog order, I took your order, and eventually I worked myself up to customer service and all that other stuff for, for them. But in December of 1996, so it's August 96, we get married. R- just shortly after, hey, you want to be a preacher's wife? No. Okay, but you're going to be anyway, because this is where I'm going. Uh, I might have to rethink this whole deal. (laughs) And then in December, my parents are like, hey, Cliff, we've got all of these computers that are coming to the office, and we purchased this multi-thousand dollar software system. It's called agency management software. And um, there is something that needs to be done to hook all of this stuff up. And unfortunately, we have no clue of what to do. But you're a computer whiz, and this is back in like the very early Windows 95 days. So this is before there was plug and play networking and hooking things up. You had to know about TCIPs and IR interrupts and all kinds of other stuff, which I knew a little bit about because I was a geek. And my mom and dad says, we want to know if you'll come and work for us in the insurance agency. And I'm like, whoa, wait, this could be this could be a dangerous thing. You know, it's it's one of those slippery slope sort of things. And I'm like, I I don't know about this. And they said, well, you know, ultimately it ended up, I said, listen, I'll come work for you as long as you will make me a promise of two things. Number one, you'll never ask me to get my, you'll never force me to get my insurance agent's license. I have no desire to sell insurance. And number two, you guys know that I feel led to do full-time ministry. And I know that there's opportunities for me to make a a significant amount of income in the world of insurance. But if I'm ever offered an opportunity to become a full-time pastor of my own church, I want your guys' blessing and no hard feelings. I, I don't want any grief given to me, regardless of how little I make as a pastor. If I'm ever offered the opportunity to become a pastor full time, I'm I'm leaving to pursue that. And they agreed. And I'm like, okay. So in December of 1996, I began what would become an 11 year career as an insurance agent because I got the computers. Although they never did force you to get your license. They never forced me to, but they gave the... me a lot of incentives. Because what happened was I ended up... Well, you didn't say they couldn't give you incentives. Yeah, they gave me incentives. They they hung money out in front of me. Uh, and, and, I, and I guess they knew. So, But the deal is, is that I, the computers took me, what, two or three weeks to get all computer set up. I learned how to use the software, went to a conference and asked all my questions and got all that stuff figured out. And I'm like, okay, now what do I do? And now I'm just an overpaid file clerk. <laughs> But then all of a sudden there is rating software is now computerized, which wasn't before. You had to look in manuals before this, but now you could do the rating software. And so I installed that and I had to train my dad, who has been an agent his entire adult life. I'm training my dad how to use rating software. And he's like, why don't you just do these quotes for me and and, um, give them to me? Now, as a non-licensed agent, I can't give quotes over the phone to people. 
So what I was doing is my dad would take all the information. He would write it down onto a, uh, a, a worksheet that I had printed out for him. I told him, this is the information I need. He would take all that information over the phone and tell him he'd call him back. He would give it to me. I would put all that information into the software. It would give me quotes plus all the different options and everything in like a heartbeat. I'd hand it back to him and he would make the phone call and he makes all the money. He goes, you realize that the only step, he goes, I could give you a commission on every single one of these. And I was doing about 10 or 15 a day. I could give you a commission on every single one of these and raise your hourly salary if, if you went and spent 40 hours in a classroom and got your license and passed the test. And I'm like, really? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, okay. So I went and got licensed and I became a property casualty agent and that too long, not too much longer after that, there was a whole lot of incentive for me to get my life and health insurance license as well. And so, yeah, by the end of this process from 1996, I worked from, you know, went from hooking up your computers to an overpaid file clerk to somebody who is then a licensed agent and ultimately ended up 11 years later, I was making a very, very generous income as, as an insurance agent. All right, so that's that, that's the that's the background here of ministry, insurance agent, us newly married, going into this life together. But another thing is is that um, Stephanie became a stay at home mom on Valentine's Day, two thousand one. I didn't even remember that it was that. I'm glad we have this detail in here. Do you want to tell a little? I could bit have of, told you that. I know exactly when it was. Tell tell us a little bit about that story. What part of that story do you want Just me to the fact that to you tell? I, what you, we're making money together. We're both bringing incomes into the household. Yeah, you know, we had never planned to not have two incomes. It, it was never in the plan. Um, through a through a matter of circumstances that could have been righted, um, I lost my job, and and after. You know, at first I, w- I was shocked and I was heartbroken and, and I, I remember coming home and I'm crying and, you know, we have, we have Megan, we just found out I was <laughs> pregnant with Matthew and um, how are we going to do this now going from, from one kid and two incomes to one income and two kids, you know, what, what's the next step? What do I do? How am I going to get a job pregnant? And, um, and. And so started the process of actually writing that wrong to get my job back. Yeah. In fact, I talked to the, your manager at the now time. No, my, my boss's boss. Your boss's so, boss, who happened to be a friend of ours from our from congregational ch- gathering <laughs> yeah. that I was a part of. And, and we explained the fact that there was some misunderstandings yeah. and some things misrepresented. And he offered, he says, have Stephanie come in Monday. We'll take, the, we'll take care of this. And... um. And over the weekend, I just had, um, I really, I really um, trust my discernment, my, intu- my intuition. I go with my gut all the time. And I just had this feeling that if those things could have escalated that quickly to me losing my job, I, that, that wasn't an environment that I wanted to go back into. It was, um, there were other things at play. It it just wasn't an environment that I wanted to go back into, and so we decided that um that I wouldn't go in on Monday and get my job back um and started talking about what it would take to live on one one income, income. which wasn't easy because the next slide in my presentation that I have here <laughs> is that Stephanie yeah. and I had a lot of debt. A lot of it. A, we lot, had a, a lot of debt. We had a student loan. We had um, a car loan that we were upside down in as far as value. Um, what? Two, we had two car loans, okay? And credit card debt as well. And of course, I brought consumer debt into our marriage. I didn't. I was a kid. Stephanie was 18 <laughs> years old. She had never experienced debt. I introduced this woman to the world of debt. Yeah. And in the early days, I was stupid with money. I mean, g- gosh, I-, I think of the the amount of times that I went to our local bank to take out personal loans to buy like twenty five hundred dollar computers. Which, I mean, in hindsight, I look at it and I'm like, wait a second, that was a pretty darn awesome investment. 
when you consider where we are today. But back then, it made no sense at all. Right. Right? Right. But Absolutely. we did what seemed to be very stupid things with money. And if you added up all of our debt total, we were about $80,000 in unsecured debt when Stephanie decided we're going to go. When we decided oh, together. Oh, way to throw that one on no, me. Okay. When we decided together that we were going to go to a one income family. Yeah. Thankfully, which by the way, probably was about the time that I said, about that li- that insurance license. About that. <laughs> so yeah, we, we had lots of debt. Now, um, at the time, I at, you know, by this time, I'm fully involved into the the like really deep end of performance-based Christianity and and all of this other stuff. I like my day and night is consumed with ministry related stuff. I was one of those guys that was, you know, all I listened to was Christian music. And when I wasn't listening to Christian music, I was listening to Christian radio broadcasting from preachers all over the world. Chuck Swindoll, um, gosh, Ravi Zacharias and... and, Hey, I like him. (laughs) Yeah, I like a lot of these guys. But the thing is, is that's, that's all I listened to was Christian radio. And we heard about this, I heard about this guy named um, Larry Burkett, and he had this thing called Money Matters. And it was after listening to him talk about money matters every day on the radio, talking about this idea of having what what was it called? It started with a B. It, it was a I think it was a budget. <laughs> I don't had, know what that is. Yeah, we had never <laughs> even contemplated. Well, no a one budget. ever taught me about a budget. No one ever taught me how to handle money. Yeah, and um, so I I had no clue. Yeah, and I didn't I, either. I, nobody had taught me about a budget, you know. I, I knew you were supposed to pay your bills. Yeah, and so that's what we did. Our, but I our, didn't necessarily know you were supposed to pay them first. We, you know, if we wanted something and we couldn't afford it, you go and get credit for it. That's why they make credit cards and give you loans at banks and all that stuff, right? And as long as you can always pay your minimum payment that you've agreed to pay on all of those things, you can with pay your for paycheck, that one item for the rest of your life. Exactly. And as long so, so, so the whole thing is is up to that point we would have our paychecks plural prior to Stephanie leaving her day job um we would have her our paychecks and we would cover these men. now the thing is is that got a lot more difficult when there was only one paycheck coming in and so it's like hey there's this thing called a budget um I've been researching it online I downloaded a spreadsheet I put it into Excel and and here's what we need to do. We need to start tracking. I need every receipt for every little penny we spent. Yeah. And then we found out who was really spending the money. <laughs> yeah, it was me. It wasn't me because I wasn't leaving the house. See how uh, that was working? Yeah. Um, and so shortly after that, um, we started, because um, even before this next slide, um, we, we saved all of those receipts for like a month or two or something. Um, leading up to... Tax return season. And with our tax return, we um we use that to get a month ahead on everything. Right. So not only were we caught up, but now we're ahead. And then we heard this of this dude who I have not always said nice things about, but um but his method works. And so we heard about Dave Ramsey. Yeah. So that that was our introduction to this guy named Dave Ramsey. I started listening to him on the radio, and I'm hearing him say things like debt is dumb, cash is king, the, the paid-off home mortgage is the status symbol of America, or has replaced the BMW as the status symbol of America. You have to be, you have to, uh, be willing to uh, live on rice and beans. You have to be willing to live like no one else so that later on in life, you can live like no one else. Yeah. So I come home, and I tell Stephanie about Dave Ramsey. Uh, we got the Total Money Makeover book, and w- and Stephanie was not happy with this guy or the way that it, he got me to thinking at first. Uh, but then we went to, I think, Louisville in s- the summer of 2004, and we went to a live event. Tell us about the live event. I went, that's all I remember. I rem- <laughs> that's that's not- all you remember? <laughs> no. I-, I remember him locking himself up in um, chains on on stage i I don't remember a lot but i remember coming out of that thinking "Ah, debt-free might be right 
debt free might be right. Yep. And he talked in that live event about you've got to be willing to sell things. Yep. And and you need to be so crazy and aggressive with selling things that your kids afraid they, are, they're, they're afraid, next. <laughs> they're afraid that they're next to go. Um, I I think that um, oh, where was I going with this? I don't remember where I was going with this. I had a point, but now I've lost it. So, um, I mean, there there were times, seriously, there were times when I really was not liking Dave Ramsey. I was probably liking Cliff less. Um, but I continued to make those sacrifices. Yes. I continue. I mean, I didn't. I didn't, you know, throw you a hand gesture and go behind your back and do it anyway. Um. We stuck with it. It was hard. Yep. It sucked a lot. It really sucked a lot. And, um, and, but I, re- that my point. So it was, I remember him saying, um, at that live event, talking about the, the class. Is it 12 weeks or, or whatever? Um, the total money makeover, mm-hmm. um, class that they offer. And, um, and it's, it's got like, at that time, what seemed like an astronomical price tag attached to it. Yeah, it was like it was like one hundred and eighty dollars or something. I like don't that. even remember, but I'm like, you think I have that? <laughs> like, yeah, it's like one hundred and eighty dollars. Right? Seemed like what on earth? Why don't I just give you a, a kidney? <laughs> and he, and and I remember Dave saying, "You're all sitting there thinking, you can't afford that. I can't afford to do that." And he looked out. And I swear he made eye contact with me and he said, you can't afford not to. Yep. And I've done my time where I lived like no one else. Mm -hmm. And by golly, I'm on the other side and now I'm living like no one else. Yes, we are. And it's very awesome. But it was was not without a lot of pain, a lot of struggle. Sometimes I say yes to my kids now on the stupidest things just because I spent years telling them no. Yeah. I'm not even I'm not even lying. And and it's it's not all of the time. Mm-hmm. But sometimes I say yes just because I spent so much time saying no. I still say no a lot. Yeah. I still say no a lot. But sometimes they get a yes just because I said no so many times yeah. before. And for me, sometimes I just want to continue. You say no all the time no I, matter what. I still want to say no all the time. No, because you do. <laughs> I, I, I still say no all the time because I, I want them to understand the, de- the need and desire to make it on your own. No, and, and, and that's our responsibility to teach them that. Yeah. that it, it's our responsibility to, to teach them that. We balance each other well. Um, but even when, even when it's a question that makes sense, you still answer no first. And then you'll come back and you'll be like, I thought about it. And I just, you know, that no really didn't make sense. So, yeah. So it's a yes. But your go to answer is always no. I, yeah. And that's something that has served me extremely you always well. Always say no. In all, in all areas of life. Oh, I'm really good at saying no too. All right. So, okay. Here's the deal. So it was 2000, summer of 2004. Um, we went to that live event. Um, and then not too long after that. And we started that, our debt snowball. We started then. our debt snowball. But I will say this, though. We, we knew that life was getting ready to get crazy. And we made a decision together to do something. One last very stupid thing. Do you know what Have I'm talking another about? another baby. No. <laughs> no. Well, because that, that 2004 thing and, and it was, we had an... It was moving, and so we were renting a house um, um, from my parents at the no, time. That's that's we moved before we went to that live event. Okay, we moved in October of two thousand three. But it's still it, b- before we got serious so, about Dave Ramsey. We put ourselves in more debt. We put ourselves in more debt. We bought a house we couldn't afford. We, we could not afford a, a house, so we were renting a house. My mom and dad purchased a house that we so that we could rent it. Yes. So I'm already f- working for mom and dad. Now mom and dad's our landlord. And oh, hold on. What? They're also our neighbor. And they were also our neighbor. And, <laughs> and you know, here I am. I'm trying to become an adult, you know, a responsible adult. And, and yeah, granted, I'm working hard as an insurance. Yep. I, I Trust me, I was a great insurance agent. Uh, I hated it. It was the most soul-sucking job on you the face. You didn't always hate it. I didn't always hate it. That's true. I didn't discover how much I hated it until I discovered what I loved. Right. And we're going to So we're don't give it a, don't give it a completely unfair rap because there was a time I loved it because when it was you the really only felt thing like I knew. You it, it okay. Say the, say what you were going to say. Well, I'm I'll give you that. 
if you want to say you loved it because it was the only thing that you knew. But I will tell you that during that time when you were selling um, at your highest, yeah, and when you were making the top top marks on on the Grange leaderboard, yes, um, you had said, "This is where I'm supposed to be. Yes, this is I'm ministering to these people. They they I'm offering them the life insurance to take care of their families if something happens. I mean, you you were you were there. You were in the moment." Until you found what you loved more. Yes. And and the, and what I found that I loved is was selling term life insurance instead of permanent life insurance. So it, it's harder to make a living from selling term because the commissions are so much lower. But they're very good if you are selling lots of them. And to sell lots of them, you have to help lots of people. And to sell them, you can't just sell them a term policy and let them go on with their mindset of you're always going to be in debt and you're always going to need life insurance when you're 90 years old. Uh, instead, you have to educate them on the idea of living debt free and introducing them to this plan and and the fact that it makes sense for you to, instead of a lifetime policy that costs you hundreds of dollars, you instead buy a policy that costs you you know twenty five dollars a month and you have it for the next thirty years and the plan is for you to be debt free and have hundreds of thousands of dollars worth more than what you have in life insurance by the time this policy technically expires its guaranteed premium. But in case, worst case scenario, if you don't reach that goal, it still continues, but at a much higher price. So, but the whole thing is, is I was educating, I was teaching, I was encouraging, I was inspiring people. And that's what I, that's what I fell in love with. And at the time, that was the only way I knew to let all of that out. This, this educating, encouraging, and inspiring people to take action and to think differently about their life and what's possible and debt and all those things, it opened up something new inside of me. And I learned all that from Dave Ramsey and the sales training and stuff like that that I had for, pot, for life insurance. So yes, I did enjoy it there for a while. But let's get back to this really crazy, stupid thing that we did about how we decided to go into more debt. So I'm... I'm Working for mom and dad, I rent from mom and dad. We have another child on the way. This house is getting a little, you know, we, we don't have city water or in the winter time. Things are really crazy when we run out of water um, and getting out of our home that's ha a, you know a quarter mile into the woods. This is not. There's a lot of things that aren't great about our living situation. All in the breeze that comes through through the winter time as well. Uh, through the walls in our A-frame home, but um, so we decided we want to build a house. We want to move. We want to move into a new home in in the city with greater internet connection. I love that you call it in the city. Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> At the, it is more go, of a city ahead. today it, it, than it was. Yeah. But anyway, so we wanted to we wanted to move we wanted to move into an area where there was a neighborhood. We had a house, good internet connection, and city water. Those were pretty important to us. And we looked at houses that were pre-built already, and for the same price, we could build a brand new house, uh, at least a starter home. We call it a split level. Here in our area, they're called bi-levels, but it, most people all around the world know them as split levels. 1,200-square-foot um, home, built brand new, and what was the cost at the time? 135000 or something like that? I think so. And the amount of money that we could afford to put down as a down payment on our new home zero. was zero dollars. <laughs> now, thankfully for the crazy, stupid real estate market back then, uh, they had all those crazy things where they let people who could not afford new homes buy new homes with no money down. We were those stupid people. <laughs> all right. So we knew Dave Ramsey would not approve of this. We knew what we were doing was stupid, but also we, we both saw the trajectory that my career in insurance was heading. I mean, we were, we were ramping up things aggressively on the income scale. Uh, at the time, I think I was selling like 20 to 30 insurance policies per month. That's life insurance policies. And so I, I knew we could pull it off, but it was going to be tough and still work on paying down our debt. So anyway, in December 2005, or actually, in, it, whenever we did that, we bought this house that we couldn't afford, and we were still paying down our debt. And, and then... In December 2005, we were already in our new home, and I remember we couldn't afford an HD TV at the time, so we were watching. Uh, or actually, you started watching this television show. Tell us about the TV show Lost. When did you first hear about it, and what 
what was going on and did you um, ever try to convince me to watch it? I can't remember. I did. Um, I started hearing about it um, just on on promos on the TV while I was watching other shows on ABC. Um, they would show they would show this this commercial, and every time they showed the commercial, it doesn't matter what clips they showed. Every time they ended with Charlie saying, "Guys, where are we?" And I just wanted to know where they were. I just wanted to know where they were. So um, I started watching Lost. And I asked Cliff to watch it with me. But he always had something else going on. He wasn't really into it. You know, whatever. Every um, excuse that he could make up, he did. And then in the season finale of season one, he was in the room while I was watching it. And And they opened that hatch. Or found the hatch, or did they open it? I think no, they didn't open it. They didn't that open didn't it. Happen until they season two. Found it, and then he was intrigued. Yeah, John Locke and I think Hurley, um, they had dug up some a hold and uncovered this, and all of a sudden this light emanates from it on the other side of the island. They had just finished the completion of the raft. I hope that people have watched Lost by now. <laughs> if not, we're sorry. So uh, we're we're spoiling the end of the first season for you. But um, anyway, they they got on the raft, and then and, and by the way, if you haven't watched the first season of Lost, please do me a favor and just fast forward, like hit the plus thirty second button like five times, and then cut catch back up with this because you don't want to hear this. But anyway, so they <laughs> okay, so those people have fast forwarded. Basically, what happens is they're they're on this raft, they're escaping the a, a crew of them are escaping the island. And everything seems fine. And then all of a sudden there's a boat. They think they're rescued. And you got Mr. Happy or Mr. Whatever. I don't uh, know. Anyway, Mr. Something. I can't remember what we used to call him. But uh, Mr. Friendly. Friendly. Mr. Friendly comes up and he, and he has this accent. He goes, we're going to have to dig the boy. <laughs> and so they take Walt. And then they leave the other guys stranded. And, and now that we, we end season one, basically. And I'm like, okay. What the heck? There's a mystery. What what's in this hatch underground? What what the heck's up with this this underground bunker? Who are these people that just stole this kid? What is going on here? And and I, in one episode, sitting on the couch, I'm hooked. I'm like, okay, I've got to understand this. And so, I'm already actively listening to podcasts at this point. I am an avid podcast consumer, and so I look online to see if there are any podcasts devoted to the TV show Lost. There were five already. <laughs> I subscribe to all five of them, and I'm listening to them, hearing their theories about the end of that episode uh, of that first season. And I found a method before there was a, a legal method for you to watch the first season after it had just aired because it wasn't available online yet. I decided to download all of season one. That's and before Netflix. It was way before Netflix. <laughs> and, and Hulu. <laughs> and we – did you watch them with me? I think so. I, so we sat down and we watched every episode of the first season of Lost in like a two-week period of time. And I was hooked. And I started to call in theories to the podcast that already existed. One of them, Ryan and Jen, had this sh- show called The Transmission. I called in a theory. They cl- said, Cliff, oh my gosh, that's an amazing theory. You should do your own podcast. And I'm like, seriously? And I'm like, Okay. And so in December of 2005, Stephanie, December 16th, 2005, I recorded the very first episode of a show called Generally Speaking. And that podcast at the time, I didn't think, I figured there were already five other podcasts about the TV show Law. So who am I to come along and create a sixth one? And those people know far more than I do. So I'm like, I can't do a Lost podcast. And I'm really interested in technology, if you guys didn't know. And so... I, I thought, okay, but there are already so many podcasts about technology. Who am I to create a, an authority site or podcast on technology? So I can't do that. And then I, the only other thing that I'm interested in is my faith. And I'm like, okay, but gosh, you've got Charles Swindoll and Ravi Zacharias and all these other guys. These guys have podcasts. Who am I to actually get out there and start talking about faith in a podcast? So I decided, okay, nobody's going to want to hear me talk anyway. And I'll be lucky if I get five people who listen. But I create the very first episode on December 16th, 2005, 
and it's called the Generally Speaking Podcast, where I will just generally speak about anything I'm passionate about. And I record that episode. You can find it, by the way. It's currently still available at GSPN, which stands for Generally Speaking Production Network, gspn.tv slash first episode, all spelled out, F-I-R-S-T episode, gspn.tv slash first episode. Anyway, that first episode was online. I put it out there. 500 people listened to it within the first few days. Blew my mind. And then I'm like, and, and then people were saying, Cliff, you should do a podcast just about Lost. I would subscribe to that. I don't care about your technology. I certainly don't care about hearing about your faith, but I would love to hear more of what you have to say about the TV show Lost. And so the second episode, I invite you, and we also had our next door neighbor at the time who was also into the, deep into the show. And the three of us got together, and the second week I said, hey, everybody, welcome to the second episode of the generally speaking or the weekly lost podcast of the generally speaking production network because I knew it was production network because I wanted to create other podcasts because I wanted to talk about faith I wanted to talk about uh, technology and obviously people wanted to hear me talk about lost and so I brought you guys in and I have a little audio clip of our intro from back then hey cool you fixed it don't expect anything the chances of getting a signal are slim at best static's good right no Reception is good. Wait, what's that? It's Russo's signal. Oh, crap. But this radio has a wider bandwidth. <laughs> That's what you call a party in a podcast. Hold it! Stop! Do you hear that? Welcome to the weekly Lost Edition of the Generally Speaking Production Network. Now, here are your hosts, Stephanie and Cliff. And then we would start just like this, and the music would slowly fade in the background, and we would come back, and we would talk about Lost. And we would do that twice a week, every week, for a very long time. And I'm going to go, if you go to lostpodcast.com, lostpodcast.com, you will find we did 261 episodes from December 2005 all the way through the show's end, June 2010. Mm-hmm. All right. And it was so cool because I thought, who's going to listen to us, right? Turns out the writers of the show listen to Cliff and Stephanie talk about the TV show Lost. The producers of the show talk or listen to the Weekly Lost podcast with Cliff and Stephanie. Not only did the producers listen to the show, but I am absolutely convinced they changed major storylines <laughs> because I was on to them. And I have proof. You do not. <laughs> I do. Your head doesn't fit. I know. You need to let your headphones out a little bit. But the the cool thing is, is that I thought. <laughs> I, know, I, I know. I like that. You like that? So, but the cool thing is, is that even the actors of the show, like Jorge Garcia, listened, and in fact, he called in one time, and we included him as a part of our um, listener feedback hotline segment, where it says, "Hey, Cliff, Stephanie, this is Jorge. So, have a listen to this." Yes. Colonel Locke, is this line secure? Line secure, go ahead. Hey, Cliff, Stephanie, it's Hoy. This is Michelle from Texas. This is Kim from Indiana. Josh from California. Jennifer from Florida. Sam in Tucson. Kimberly from California. Paul in Memphis, Tennessee. Listener feedback. Target area is acquired. We are a go. Roger that. All right, so obviously we got our start with a television show devoted to Lost. The podcast developed it. Uh, I'm sorry, with a podcast devoted to the television show Lost. And we were not looking to make money from this thing um, because I was making plenty of money at this point in insurance and my income was scaling up pretty quickly. And um, so things are going extremely well financially. Uh, in spite of the fact that we just took on this massive debt of our home. But things are going really well financially for us. And um, the the podcast was like w- extremely well received. Now, this doesn't happen for everyone, and there's a lot of reasons why this happened. But a couple things. Number one, when we started podcasting about the TV show Lost, it was right about the time that um, Apple brought podcasts, the directory of podcasts, into iTunes, which also happened to be about the same exact time that they started making the TV show episodes 
available the next day for purchase for $1.99 or $2.99 the very next day after they aired. And so people would go into iTunes and they would look, they would do a search for Lost and it would actually show search results. It would say TV show episodes and then music soundtracks. And then the third one down was podcasts. And it just so happened because of how things worked out, the official Lost podcast was first and the weekly Lost podcast with Cliff and Stephanie was number two. And as a result of all of those things, plus the fact that the existing five people who had podcast created a network where they shared a syndication of our feeds. What's so funny? Our children are watching our live stream while on their way home from school. Gotcha. Okay, cool. So hello, children. Um, Anyway, so the thing is, is that, um, what was I saying? I, I have no idea what I was saying now. Um, they were going in, they were searching Lost. Oh, they were, they were searching fr- for Lost. And so we were right next to the official Lost podcast. And the all the other Lost podcasters, before I started podcasting, they already created a Lost podcast network where it was a shared feed where everybody had their own podcast feeds, but they, but they invited other people who had Lost podcast to also syndicate there as well. So if you looked at the total of people who subscribed to our podcast in our own feed plus their feed, we had, I think it was like something like 27,000 subscribers by our third episode. What the heck? This was the most insane thing. And people all of a sudden would listen to us. Our podcast, the, the show talked about different themes in life. Do you remember some of the themes of the show? There was like all, no, that, all good cowboys have daddy issues. That, that's true. Um, there were so many. And that was a really long time ago. Well, there, there was an episode called the 23rd Psalm. There was an episode about there, baptism. Mean, so they touched on so many different things. Tabula rasa, clean, starting over with a, with clean, a clean slate. slate. Yeah. So many opportunities for Stephanie and I to share our heart, our experiences in life, um, and bring them to this podcast where all of a sudden people would normally not say, hey, I wonder, first of all, people before finding the podcast had no idea who we were. What you looking at? Nothing. Okay. Am I keeping you? <laughs> <laughs> you said I have an hour. We still got nine minutes left. Okay. Yeah. They're not here yet, but they're on their way. So they're they're Okay. So anyway, um the tabula it, people wouldn't at that point they, they had no idea who Cliff and Stephanie were. So they weren't looking for podcasts to find out what Cliff and Stephanie thought about life. No, they were looking for lost podcasts. They but through sharing about Lost and these different themes that they were touching on, people were finding out more about us in a very vague way. Exactly. And then we started to get requests to have another show where we just talked about life and our faith and 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 us as as people. Exactly. So people people would write in and say, "Wow, I'm I'm so glad you talked about XYZ in your podcast." Would you do me a favor and elaborate more on that marriage seminar that the two of you went to that you talked about? It, would you elaborate more on living debt-free? What the heck? I've never heard anybody else talk about this idea or this concept of living debt-free. Can you talk more about that? And the reality is, is we knew we could get by with talking about those themes if the episode of the show touched on, touched on it. But if it didn't relate to what was going on in the TV show, we knew that we would not it would not go over with our listeners if we just went on talking about our own random stuff and, and and things like that. So in March of 2006, we launched a second podcast, and I called it My Crazy Life. And the idea was that this is the show, kind of like generally speaking, where we could talk about anything and everything we want, right? Mm-hmm. That show eventually became Pursuing a Balanced Life, and that show eventually had nearly 600 episodes before I, I finally ended it. But anyway... We launched this second podcast, and I remember um, there were episodes in the very beginning that were direct responses to people who listened to the Lost podcast, heard us talk about a theme, and said, hey, can you tell us more about that? So, for example, some of the earliest episodes of that second podcast, one of the titles was Sex and the Vagina, (laughs) which I can't even remember what that was. I'm pretty sure that was about um, using um, correct wording in speaking to our children 
about their body parts. Yes, that's right. So we didn't I, call it a bum. We didn't call it a, you know. A, nope. It, it, we, we, it, and when our three-year-old climbs in the car and says, Papal's got a penis, you know you're doing something right. Exactly. So, so we did an episode called Sex in the Vagina. We did an episode called Kim's Email. So we had a friend and a listener that listened to us and said, hey, can you tell, us, tell me more about how you came to faith uh, and how you came to believe in Jesus? Because I just don't understand that. And I'm like, okay, this is something that I'd be happy to talk about. Certainly not going to go to the Lost Podcast. Mm-hmm. I could share it with her in in a in a email. Oh, but, but y'all don't want that. <laughs> But the thing is, as I said, do you mind if I read your email and and respond and respond because I think other people out there would like to hear how I came to faith as well. And and she says I don't mind. And and I told her I, I say I, I'll leave your name out of it. She goes no, use my name please. And so the I think it was episode three of My Crazy Life. I I can't remember if that's for sure, but it was certainly one of the first four or five episodes, and it was titled Kim's email. And that's where I just shared my story of how I came to faith. And she wrote me later that day and says, Cliff, I listened to the episode. I had to leave work because I was crying uncontrollably. I want to let you know that I've come to faith in Christ. I need to know what happens next. Now what? And and I'm like, this is a guy whose heart has been set on full-time ministry, right? And, um, and also we did an episode on living debt-free. So many different things that we talked about. One threats the marital one. Is, we've talked about so many things over the years. So all of a sudden, I realize we're doing ministry to tens of thousands of people all over the world. And um, in April 2006, I ended up launching, I think it was my third podcast. At the time, it was called About the Church. Eventually, I, you keep looking down. Is, is, what, what's going on? They're texting me. Oh. Our children are watching. Children, please stop texting. It te- looks like Stephanie's like, she's not caring right now, and this video's going out on our website. Please stop it. I don't think it looks like that because I've already said. Okay, so just know that if Stephanie looks like she's checking the time all the time, she's reading text messages from our kids. And I've had to go to the bathroom for like 45 minutes. <laughs> Do you want to pause? I can, no, go ahead. I can pause the recording and no. we can come back. Um. They're listening and awesome. They're listening and responding. And I know that you said that we, you know, this was a non interactive recording, but they're my children. Okay, cool. So, so, they're... and they're, I mean, the only one who's not typing is the one who's driving. So, right. I'm getting two kids who are back to back responding. And by the way, for those watching this replay later, um, especially if you're watching the video on the website or whatever, and for those of you who are listening to the podcast, um, we are broadcasting this live on Facebook, so that's how the kids know that we're <laughs> what we're saying here. Um, Which I'm now starting to question of whether or not I should have gone live with this McKenna's thing. McKenna's last one says that's because she doesn't care. I know. <laughs> Thanks, McKenna. All right. So, um, April 2006, I launched a podcast called About the Church. It eventually became Encouraging Others Through Christ. Uh, in November 2006. Um, I just I made the decision to step away from all official positions within the local congregational now, gatherings. We had switched um, congregational gatherings several times, several times since that initial calling um, in ninety six or ninety seven, whenever that was. So we weren't at that same. We weren't with that same. We weren't with the Nazarene Church anymore, and had switched two more times. Um, before le- leading up to this stepping away from the um, traditional model church that we had been a part of yep. our lives. In fact, there's a story that goes into that. Um, we, I had offered, we were a part of a actual mega church, a, a small mm-hmm. mega church, five to 6,000 people who attended on the weekends. And it was uh, a church of Christ. And we were a part of a kind of, you could call it a young adult ministry there. And I was the pastor of small groups. And as the thing is, is I'm very headstrong into podcasting. I, I was one of the first, I think I was one of the first 100 to 150 podcasters in the world. So I was early on into the podcasting thing. And at this point, it, in, by November 2006, I'm working my minimum of 40 hours a week at the insurance office. And I'm working, would you tell me, now Stephanie will tell me when I'm exaggerating. 
I'm not exaggerating when I'm saying that I worked somewhere between 20 to 40 hours a week in podcasting on the side, right? No. Okay. You're so, not exaggerating. That. So it was so I had a full-time career as an insurance agent and I'm literally full-time hobby. And and now at, at that point at, <laughs> at that point um where when 2005 when this started and your insurance is really taken off and all this you're like we're doing good financially and now um, into 2006, 2007, we're starting to take a hit because you're doing the bare minimum out of insurance so that you can be here doing what you want to do. Yep. And, um, so, our, and so, so my daily insurance career income is slowly going down. Now, it's still, uh, we got it up pretty darn high. Right. I mean, it, it was, it was high. But we, we took, we, but what happened is my, my salary continued, but my insurance commissions, we're going like this because I was no longer pushing insurance sales as much because I wasn't working the extra hours. I mean, when I at the height, I was working 60 hours a week at the insurance office. But by this time, by November of 2006, I'm already bare minimum. I will not work more than 40 hours a week in this office because I've got other things to do. I got to get podcasting. And it's not just podcasting, it's interacting with people. I mean, it was online community building. It was social media. It's responding to literally hundreds of emails a day every single day. Literally, I believe having a powerful positive impact in people's lives. That's what I was doing on the side. And it was November 2006 where I went to our, our folks at the congregational gathering. You'll notice that we interchanged the words congregational gathering. We replaced the word church because we have a very strong feeling that church is not a building, nor is it the weekly gathering of people. The church is the people who are believers. I said that in the beginning. I know. But, um, so I, but anyway, um, at the time, I still used the word church all the time. And so I, in November, I remember going to them. They said, hey, we want to launch a podcast of the weekly sermons for our ministry here. And I offered to do it for them for free out of the kindness of my heart. I said, guys, I have tons of experience doing this. And they said, no, Cliff, I'm sorry. When we do this, we want to do it with excellence. That, those were the words that they shared with me. And also, by the way, we're, we want to have a talk with you. We're a little concerned about how consumed you are with your hobby. Um, they, they said the words, um, they said, we know that your, your income, you've, you've stressed that you know, you're working the bare minimum. We know that you're working less hours there. But also, we have more and more meetings. As we want to bring you up into the leadership of the congregation here, we want to we recommend you as a deacon. Uh, which is the only way for you to ultimately become an elder so that you can have a voting role within this congregation. Um, I mean, it, th these are the exact words that were being mm -hmm. shared. Um, we need you to attend more meetings. And also we need you to attend all three weekend um, worship services here. And we also need you once a month to uh, make yourself available to deliver uh, communion to the all the shut-ins, and also we need you to be available during the winter time to help shovel all the and sidewalks. And also, and also, and, and also, also these and additional also. meetings and and all this stuff. And I said, guys, I can't do that. And they said, why not? And they said, because I have all this podcasting stuff that I do on the side. And they said, yeah, we want to talk to you about it. We we think you should seriously pray about how much time you're spending there because we think that this is unhealthy, and, and you know, with all that you've got going on. And, and of course, at that point, I'm like totally headstrong. It's like, these are people who are my spiritual leaders. These are the people who are there to shepherd and guide me and to help me grow spiritually. And so I took what they said to heart. And I en ultimately ended up saying, you know what, I'm going to quit podcasting because it is, it is severely impacting my career as an insurance agent. It is impacting my income and it is, it's impacting my ability to serve in this calling of potentially becoming a pastor one day. And, and that doesn't even account for how it was impacting our family. Right. I mean, the, at, that, at that point, the church came before our family anyway, whatever they needed, whatever they wanted, whatever they... And I remember you coming home and telling me that you had offered to, to do the, um, the sermons it, podcast and, um, and to do that, and that you were told... 
no, because they wanted it done with excellence. And my aunt, I remember, I've been crushing the mold since I was 18. <laughs> and I remember thinking, these people don't know you at all. No. They, they never listened to they a single podcast episode I ever produced. Uh, outside of podcast. Outside of podcast. They don't know you at all. And, um... But you came home and you said it's it's got to be one or the other, and um, meaning insurance or or podcasting, it's got to be more. It's got to be one or the other. Um, I've got to give up one, and since insurance is where the money's coming from, I'll give up podcasting. That's exactly it. And I stopped podcasting. I I quit cold turkey for like a week, guys. <laughs> it was a week. It was the darkest week that the Ravenscrafts have ever seen. It I was mean, horrid. For real. If there was ever a week where you think this is just not what I signed up for. I mean, I can't even describe the moping, the depression, the I mean, it was just dark. It was very dark. It, you and I don't even know if I ever told you Stephanie how dark it was in my mind. Oh, I mean, honey. <laughs> while they didn't know you, I think I did. Yeah. I, you don't have to use words for me to see that darkness. I mean, you don't, you don't have to describe that with words. I knew that it was dark. Right. Yeah. So for me, and I'll explain to folks how dark it was. For me, it was I would get up in the morning. Um, I'd need to be at work at 830. I would get out of bed around 820. Because oh, it, it was like a seven minute walk. Yeah, to work. Yeah, so it it was a two minute drive. Eight. I I would get up at eight twenty. I'd spend five ten minutes, uh, preparing to get to ready for work, and I would I would show up, and I'd usually be about five or seven minutes late getting to work, and then I would sit there all day long, and had the most dreary, boring existence you can imagine. The only thing I could think of all day long was how long, how many hours before I can, <laughs> how many hours before I can, okay, I have to stop for just a second because we have to show what what's going on we, here. We now have an in-studio audience. We have an in-studio audience. Hold on, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something I shouldn't do. I'm going to show folks what's going on here. No, don't run. Okay, so we're back. Okay, what was I saying? Oh, so it was, so I all, the only thing I could think of. You guys can't interrupt, okay? Um, the thing is, though, is I could not think of anything other than how long, how many hours before I can go to sleep, how to to dull the pain I feel inside. It wasn't like how many hours before I can go home and see my kids. How many hours? No, I just want to know how many hours before I can go home. And just go to bed and numb the pain. And I would wake up. I would go home. I would literally just go straight to bed. And um, I'd get up the next morning. And again, I did not want to get out of bed. It was the. It was the. I was like, can't I just sleep here all day, every day? And it. It. I had never been that depressed before in my life. And after one week of it, I said, forget this. Did I've you say forget to... this, or did I call enough? I don't remember. I don't either. But but it's like I I I'm I'm podcasting again. That's like I the next week I'm like guys I'm back, <laughs> here I am, and this is why. And that's when I started to dream. Is it possible? Is it possible f for me to make a full time career out of this? It because because I I know that this is impacting my insurance job, but but it's we've got to figure out something. Is it possible? Oh, and by the way, in the November, I went back to the leaders of the co co congregational gathering. And when I decided to step away from all positions, I said, guys, you are absolutely right. Thank you so much for approaching me. You had, you had told me that you were concerned about how much I was involved in all of these different areas of my life and that it seemed unhealthy and, and that, um, I might, and I didn't say this before, but I might actually be losing sight of what my real calling is, how God had called me to full-time ministry and, and the path that God had me on, uh, and that I really needed to question where all the things that I was invested in with my time 
uh, whether or not something needed to be cut out. And they were obviously assuming that would be podcasting. And I said, you guys are right. And after a week of, of <laughs> a very intense prayer, I can tell you guys are absolutely right. God's clearly informed me that something needs to be cut out. And by the way, official and to for the, that reason, and for, I'm out. I said, I officially withdraw from every position within this congregation. Um, not only that, I, I mean, I'm no longer going to be pastor of small groups. I will no longer lead small groups here. And my wife and I are no lead, longer attending. We are no longer going to attend this congregation any longer. And um, and in November 2006, in the About the Church podcast, I did a five-part series titled Why I Hate the Church. And it wasn't the church, like the ecclesia, the, 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 the people, uh, but the, just the, the, politics. The, the politics of the local church, uh, which are weekly congregational gatherings. So anyway, um, uh, anyway, all of that stuff, um, it, I think it was December 2006, so one year after I, one year after I started podcasting as a hobby and had all these other different podcasts that we started. Um, and right after I decided, okay, I am going to be podcasting and I'm questioning how can I turn this into some kind of form of income to replace what's being lost in my insurance job. I decided in January or in December of 2006 to launch podcast answer man, uh, which I think was like my fourth or fifth podcast at the time. And I said, Hey guys, I, I don't have all the answers, but I will tell you, I'm somebody that's so passionate about podcasting, not just the technology stuff, but I'm good at the technology stuff. I can teach you all kinds of stuff about the technical ins and outs of podcasting. But what I'm so passionate about is what opportunities exist for everyday, ordinary people to put their message into the world and have a powerful and positive impact in the lives of others. That's what I'm passionate about. And if you have questions, if I don't have the answers already, I will find them. This is the Podcast Answer Man show. And, well, of course, now this officially is episode 500 of that podcast. And we started to move forward. And, by the way, in that very first episode, I said, hey, guys, here's my dream. It would be awesome if within five to ten years from now, if I could find a way to make podcasting and or create some kind of business where I could do what I love for a living, which is, by the way, entertaining people, educating people, encouraging people, and inspiring others. That's what I want to do with my life. Is there any way I can do that without relying on a career in insurance? And my listeners who were entrepreneurs started to reach out and speak up and say, here's all the ways you could do this, Cliff. We see it in you. We know this is your calling. We've seen it for years. And if there's anything we can do to help, we will. By the way, uh, because of the career in insurance, even though the, the commission income was slowly going down, we were still trucking away. And in February 2007, something happened, Steph. What is it? We became debt-free. Minus our Minus mortgage. Minus our mortgage. Yep. So we finally... Which is... Yeah, go ahead. The mortgage is an unsecured debt. Right. So we, we became debt-free from unsecured debt. Yeah. Um, so everything was paid off except for our mortgage. So February 2007. Which really sets the first, I think becoming debt-free really sets the first um, paving stone into the journey that was the rest of 2007. Yeah. It, it, and and, and it, I will tell you, for us, the fact that we were debt-free made it, like what you said, possible for us because, to make some decisions. Right. And and had had you had we not experienced that in february we would not been able to decide in october which isn't a long time that we were completely changing course yeah like so february was the first stone in your yellow brick road yes it was so what happened was, you know, became debt free. And now all of a sudden, when we have money, we're actually putting money into savings. <gasps> How crazy is that? We're able Although we had continued to hold a $1,000 emergency fund since we started Dave Ramsey. Yeah, we, yeah, we had the $1,000 emergency fund but like now within weeks of attending the live event. Yes. And now we are building that 
big among the three to six month of income. Six, right. We've finished our debt snowball and we're finally on we were step, step three. two or yeah, three or three. whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because step one was emergency fund of $1,000. Step two was debt snowball. Step three was three to six months of income okay. in the emergency fund. Um, and, and because of starting our own business, we kind of hover at step three Woo! throughout the years. Yeah. Uh, but, but things are good. But anyway, so because we're debt free, all of a sudden there's a lot less pressure financially. And, and all of a sudden there are opportunities, you know, the fact that my insurance, um, commissions are going down, it, it, it's not as impactful as, as what we thought it was going to be. And I'm starting now because all of a sudden I'm intentionally looking for ways to generate income. I get listeners who are saying, Cliff, I will get on a phone call with you and tell you, I'll give you 15 ways that you can generate income. Knowing everything I know from listening to all the podcasts that you produce, because I feel like I really know you and I believe that you have potential that you're not seeing in yourself. And so I would have those calls. They would tell me about different webinars I could do, different training seminars, uh, one-on-one coaching, equipment sales, all of these different things. I would come home and then relate everything these people are telling me to you. And I, you, I believe, believed them more than I did. You, you had more faith in me than I had in myself. And I'm not, we don't need to go too much further into this, except for to say, from this point, um, eventually things started to where I was making a pretty significant amount of income when you consider, you know, I'm, only, I'm less than two years into this, and we're already in, in just a couple months into intentionally trying to generate income. Because before, before I think before 2007, there was no desire to make income. This was just a pure hobby and also just doing it for the heart of ministry, right? But in two, starting in 2007, very beginning of 2007, it's like, I wonder if we can generate some money from this. And within the first couple months, we're already generating somewhere between $1,000 to sometimes three dollars or $4,000 per month. And, and that seemed to be about as much as I could pull off with the amount of time that I had to devote to it until we got till se- to September of 2007. When you said I had a re- I had a particularly bad day at the office, and do you remember what you said? Not verbatim. Okay, well it, it's okay because you know what, we recorded a podcast episode right after you told me everything you told me. Okay. And in December of two thousand or in September two thousand seven, I came home that day, and I, the w- way that I remember it right now is you said, "Listen, you need to go in tomorrow and put in your notice." You need to quit your job and insurance because by this time, that week off of of podcasting and doing insurance, that's the day, that's the period of time it became clear to me that my career had become a soul sucking job. And it was keeping me from something that I felt in my heart was my next season of life where God was calling me. And it was this ministry, but it wasn't just ministry as a pastor of a local congregation, it was a ministry through having an online business. And that that became very clear to me how I could have a profitable online business that served people, not just my paid clients, but also because I had paid clients and other streams of income, I could offer services even for free and content for free that would entertain, educate, encourage, and inspire people. And because of all of this working together, I could ultimately have a a full-time business that supports our family and the dreams of our family and also have a ministry that is effectively reaching tens of thousands and ultimately eventually hundreds of thousands of people all over the world. That was the vision. And you came I came home that day and you said, "Listen, I need my husband back. The kids need their dad back. You need to go in tomorrow and quit your job." Now, after we had that, deci- that conversation, I made the decision, I think you're right, and I said, why don't we record a podcast episode of My Crazy Life, which was Pursuing a Bounce Life or whatever. Anyway, I said, why don't we record a podcast episode right now where we tell the world and announce to them what we just decided and the conversation we just had. And that is actually at podcastanswerman.com slash 462. It's one of the most popular episodes of this podcast. I played it just you know, a couple months ago. And people are blown away 
by what we share in there. And of course, it sounds like I have a ton of confidence in the decision. We, I encourage you, listen, go to podcastanswerman.com slash 462 and listen to the recording from 2007. Stephanie had faith. She had confidence. She was bold. She proclaimed, this is your future. You know this. She was trying to convince me. I'm like, I just need to tell the world what we've decided so I don't chicken out tomorrow morning and not tell my dad. <laughs> so that's at podcastanswerman.com slash 462. Anyway, um, long story short, um, we put 98, I put a 90-day notice in. Um, I, you, you can hear all about what I thought my dad would say. And then I, in episode 462, I actually share what my dad actually, actually said, said. Mm-hmm. uh, which most incredible time, my relationship with my dad from, from the day that I told him I was quitting until today has been fundamentally different. Yes. And, and, and it's been the most rewarding aspect of our relationship was when I stepped up and said, I'm going out on my own. And and the and the words he spoke to me that day are just mind blowing. And again, it's at podcastanswerman.com slash four sixty two. Now, I will tell you I put I did go in the next day. I put in a ninety day notice and said January first, two thousand eight, I'm starting my own business. And we went from a very lucrative, very Hold on. How many times did you try to take it back oh, before I, the end of the year? I, I, I thought about <laughs> it. I, I went to my dad. Um, like four different times, and I said, hey, "What do you think about me working here? Like part time, three, three until- <laughs> days. I, I would work here Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and I would be working on building my business Saturday and Sunday, Tuesday and Thursday." And your dad said, "No." Yeah. Well, everybody else said, "Cliff, you should just tell your dad. I'm sure he's going to support you in that decision." He I said, went in. No. He said, "Absolutely not." He says, "You cannot serve two masters." He says, "You either need to completely give up." on podcasting and give this your full attention or you need to quit this and give that your full attention. Mm -hmm. He says, there is no in between. You've given me your 90 day notice. I think that was a very wise thing to give you the ramp up, but that's all you need. And that's all you're getting. He said, he goes, here's the thing. I think you would be ridiculous to not pursue the other one. Mm -hmm. And, and he said, and ultimately he said that I think you'll make more money in the end. That doing that than you would ever make an insurance, and you know how much money you can make here, and that has turned out to be quite quite true true, yep. but it wasn't immediately, no. so what I want people to know is that by this point, by January two thousand and eight, I had been doing podcasting as a hobby and for a year, and then starting to pursue a little bit of income for another year, so I'd already had two years of experience. And now January of 2000, or the year 2008, I'm now doing this full time. It's my sole income. And do you know- And there was no income. Do you remember how much income there was that year, personal income for the entire year of 2008? $11,000. $11,000 net income. And that did not come until the very end of 2008. Um, In January of 2007, or 2008, we lived off of your our December Christmas bonus. No, well, your December, no, not the Christmas bonus, the December, because we were, you held all of your checks in your oh, wallet. Oh, yes. So in January, we lived off of your December salary. Okay. In February, we lived off of your Christmas bonus. In March, we lived off of our tax return. In April, we lived off the rest of our tax return. And then in June, I think we started actually. No, it, it eventually we got to the place where we took out. We did something that we were oh, advised yes, we against. Did. We yes. were. I took out of my pension fourteen thousand dollars, and um, of the fourteen thousand dollars, we set aside four thousand dollars in taxes and penalties for taking it out, and we used that ten thousand dollars to live for three months before that's we ultimately it, started to bring in a very small paycheck. Yes. And at the end of the year, on our tax form, our net income. $11,000 for the entire year. And by the way, in 2008, I was working somewhere between 60 to 80, maybe even 85 hours a week. Yep. And I made $11,000. It was insane. I ended up in the hospital in January of 2009 as a result of it uh, with massive gallbladder problems and all kinds of other stuff. Uh, 2009 was slightly better at the beginning of the year. Ultimately, after three and a half years, uh, 
uh, I got discovered, if you will, by a guy named Dan Miller, who happened to be close personal friends with uh, Dave Ramsey. And as a result of that, he, uh, he invited us to come on his cruise and speak and to tell our story, but also to introduce us to his community. And he was a multi-million book copy sold of his book, 48 Days to the Work You Love, people who are creating their businesses online and offline who wanted to create a podcast just like Dan Miller had. And he started referring all of his community to me, booked me solid for weeks and months in advance. Finally, in 2010, we started making some money. And in 2010, (laughs) uh, it was right around the end of 2010 that I was almost to the amount of money I made as an insurance agent when I left. And um, ultimately, we got to the place where our business has generated uh, a minimum of a quarter million dollars a year and oftentimes over a half million a year. Yeah. What? I I think that that the recovery of income would have been 2011. You're right. Not 2010. Yeah. Just... But, For accuracy reasons. But here's what I will tell you is there was a very long period of time where Stephanie and I lived like no one else. And when I, we, what we mean is the Dave Ramsey sense of we lived like no one else. We, meaning, didn't, we didn't have cable. Nope. We didn't have um, satellite, you know, dish, whatever. Um, we had internet because we had to. <laughs> for the business. For, for the business. Um, we didn't eat out. We didn't um, go to the movies. We didn't buy um, frivolous things. We didn't buy necessities. Um, and some- in, in a, in a, I don't even know the descriptive word that I want to use. But I mean, we literally took in the bare minimum of groceries. Of bare um, minimum. Clothing our kids. Yep. Um, uh, we went. We went a good solid five years, and Cliff and I didn't own any new clothes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, and um, and our weight fluctuated a lot during that time. Um, we sacrificed like I have never seen people sacrifice before. Yeah. Um, I think that you know I go to these conferences and I and I go to these these different events with you and people say you know what you've done is amazing and what you because they're seeing it they're seeing it in a whole new light or they're seeing only the really good parts and and the 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 phrase that catches me the most is i want to do what you did Mm -hmm. and i look at them I'm like, I'm thinking, no, you don't. Nope. Run, forest, run. Run as far as you can. You don't want to do that. We not only sacrificed um, things, which is fine, because I had sacrificed things before, and I'm not a very material person. Um, so, so, that was, so that was fine. But we sacrificed time. Yes. And, and... Um, things that you can't get back in that time to make this happen. And, and so I don't think people understand the true meaning of the word entrepreneur. <laughs> At least the early stages. In the beginning. In, in, in the very beginning. From, from the dream from the dream to living the dream is a very long and narrow road. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I'm so glad you said all of that. Absolutely. Hands down. The number of people who've said, Cliff, can, I would love to hire you to consult with you. I have this great idea. I kind of want to go down the same path as you. And, and some of my goals are, you know, I'd like to be able to uh, I, they have, by the way, at this point when they're coming to me, zero online following. They have no social media presence at all. Uh, they have no content that they've ever created. They don't even have a blog. They have no podcast yet. Um, but they want to go from no online following, no content online. They haven't done anything to consistently serve an online community anywhere yet. But they have a desire to do so. But they want to be able to, to spin up the blog, split, spin up a podcast, create an online community to get into the top-ranked podcast in iTunes, 
to have a couple thousand people, you know, uh, uh, several thousand people on their subscribed list, th several thousand people on their mailing list, and they want it to generate enough income for them to leave their career and go into this full time within six to 18 months. And I'm like, it didn't even take us 16 to, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a long, hard process and you got to really, really want it Yeah, and, and, before you even take the first step. And here's the thing. There, there are people out there who have online programs, they have courses, they have all this stuff that promise you can do all of those things. And, and they'll show you their income statements and they'll show you all this other stuff and they show you all kinds of fancy things and they show you how lavish and extravagant their life is. But the, the story, and by the way, they, they have, these people have done very impressive things, but I happen to know those people very personally and extremely well. And I happen to know their story of what they did before they launched. Right. And who they were and the life experiences they had before they launched and the amount of income that they had as a buffer well, I to, think that to was, set them on a path that made it a lot easier. That was one of the most um that was one of the most encouraging things that I got off of that um first cruise with Dan and Joanne. They talked about their successes, but they also talked about their failures. Yes. We've been at the top. And we've been back at the bottom and had to build ourselves back to the top. And, um, and I think that with, a, now I'm, I'm not as involved in an online community anymore as you are. And, and so I'm not following these entrepreneurs who are out there sharing their story and saying, if you do, you know, A, B, and C, you can live like me. Um, but I think that a lot of those, they're failing to um to share the failures right and and that you really have to have you really have to have um the heart and the drive to go with the steps to get there because if you don't the steps don't mean anything it, it's kind of like you know it it's um it's ninety eight percent heart and it's it's two percent know how. It it is Yeah. Dan says it's seventy percent um it's it's thirty percent knowledge of the steps and the and the program or whatever. Uh but it's it's seventy percent execution. That yeah, would be the same thing. Yeah. yeah. So uh, here's here's the thing. Um, I wanna uh, I wanna announce that Stephanie and I are going to be hosting something very exciting, and I'm I'm gonna leave this both in the podcast and in this video that's gonna sit sit on our website for probably many years to come. So just know that while we're announcing specific dates here, um, if you are watching this video on the about page or on my homepage many years later, the these exact events may not be the events that are being offered. But other stuff will, and you can always reach out to me, Cliff at podcastanswerman.com. But Stephanie and I want to tell you about our next level workshop. Now, a couple of years ago, how many? It was actually three years ago next month, right? We built this house. Yeah, we've been here for three years in June. Do you do you want to wrap up and, and like, get out of here right away, or do you have another ten minutes? Well, I I have ten minutes, but that's really all I can. I and told you I could do an go hour. To the bathroom. Well, hold on, I told you an hour. I know, and I could start at one thirty. But you had done no setup, so we didn't start until one fifty. I know, and now it's three twenty-five. <laughs> I know. I, I I love you. I love you, but there are evening activities, and dinner has to be done in a certain amount of time, and I still have to go to the grocery. Okay, we I'll might, go to the grocery for you. That's not going to help me okay. any because I got to go to the grocery for what I got to cook for dinner. <laughs> gotcha. So. All right. So real quickly, you know, we, we told you guys about the house we couldn't afford. Well, ultimately, we got to the place where we could afford it. In fact, we had one, we, the podcast that, the, this right here is episode, what do we say? Three something of, 389? I don't know. This is an uh, episode. 393 of um, Family from the Heart as well. This podcast, The Family from the Heart, um, we actually started that in January of 2008. And we had a sponsor for the first four and a half years. And just to give you an idea, we got to the place where we had one podcast on a weekly basis. Had last, it, that sh This show, the Family from the Heart show, had less than 1,000 subscribers. 
Sometimes it bumped, bumped over a thousand subscribers. But paid our mortgage every but it, month. Th- we had one sponsor, Mardell Christian Bookstore, that paid the the the, and we had a very high mortgage payment. We had a very because high, remember we had no money down. Yeah, so we had a very high mortgage payment. But we had the sponsor of one podcast, Family from the Heart, paid our only debt every month for four and a half years. Yep. So just to give you an idea, um, but anyway. Um, it, a couple years, about three years ago, we had been working hard. You know, things are really starting to take off financially, but still, you know, we had some dreams. You wanted a, a new car. You wanted a new house because we were outgrowing our old house. You're all going to have to listen to past episodes of A Family from the Heart because I just said that I'm not a material person and Cliff is like yeah, no, defining but me material. So. Th- no, it, it, she wasn't material. There were really good reasons why we need, we wanted those things. Um it's Stephanie's heart for serving our kids and their friends and, and having a car that would allow her to drive our kids and all over their friends everywhere. The party bus. And also to have a home that could host all of our kids and all of their friends often. And this house does that. And we could could not do what we do now today for our children and their friends uh, in our old home. So anyway, we, we had this desire, but and the studio had outgrown our old home. Our, our studio and our business had outgrown our own home. And I had a dream of doing live workshops one so, day. So four years ago, we decided um, we can finally afford this house, but this house can't hold us anymore. And, um, and we began on the journey of, of that, that year leading up to three years ago when we moved into our, our current home. Yep. And... Um, and we moved in to this to this office space with the with the um expectation that this big open area to my left about 800 square feet <laughs> Did you catch that? Our old house was only 1,200 square yes. feet. Yes. <laughs> and, 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 and by the way, we're sitting in our studio, which is off of that 800 square feet, and we're sitting off of it into a 14 by 14 portion of this studio yep. slash office space. And and we're not even in that 800 square foot we're not, space. We're not even in that. And, and so... There, by the way, there's more square footage in the house that we're in right now than there was living square footage in our entire house previously. Yeah, that, um, in the in the office that we're in. Like, yeah, the office space yes, that we're in. Yeah. In then in the entire old house, um, but but we moved in with the expectation that that this open area to, um, my left would be used for, um, workshops and classes and and um in person masterminds and, um, all kinds of different things that were going to happen here in the studio because we had the space. We're going to we're going to sit down and teach people how to create and online businesses. People who are already pursuing online businesses, we're going to create one day business mastermind events yeah. so that we can bring them together with other people who are on this journey and share ideas and and, and all this stuff and we were going to do that and we built And then this- it became a really nice box storage space. Yep. For for 3 years. <laughs> And and then ultimately I cleaned it all out and then I created a video studio over there that which took up everything and I'm like yeah. well how can I host events here now right and I started thinking well maybe I can host events at a big event center down the road which again defeats the purpose <laughs> yeah. of building the whole big space but but now it is clean it is ready and June uh, we're gonna we're gonna host three events this year the first one's coming up on June 16th and 17th. And here's the official, I, I know that in episode 499, I hinted that this was coming and I said that it was going to be a next level podcasting. I have gone back to my original idea. This is actually going to be titled creating an online business around your podcast. All right. Creating an online business around your podcast or an introduction to online business. And the idea is this, this is a one and a half day workshop on June 16th and 17th. And June 16th is literally all day here in our studio space. And, of course, we'll feed you dinner and everything that night. Uh, We're going to go out to a nice restaurant. Um, There's going to be plenty of networking with with ourselves, but also other people who are on this journey of creating an online business. Um, The next day, on the 17th, we're going to do half day. And it's going to be an incredible day of sessions. We're going to talk about the mindset. We're going to talk about pricing, income streams. 
um, realistic expectations of how long it takes and how much work goes into this and what kind of work goes into this. We're going to talk about the things that we learned along the way, um, business tools and tactics and strategies that have helped serve us that if we would have known about in 2008, I probably would have made more than $11,000. <laughs> right. um, but also... Uh, the biggest regret, I have two that I'll share, but the two biggest regrets that I have about what I wish I would have done in the first 18 months of my business that I desperately, desperately wish I would have done differently. We're going to talk about that. We're going to answer questions. It, it's going to be an amazing thing. The idea, this, by the way, is for people who want, who are already in a day job right now who would love to create an online business where they could start to transition out of work that it ultimately has become dreadful to them, okay? Now, it, it would be nice if you already have some sort of online following, if you already have a blog. It's, not it's called creating a, a business, an online business around your podcast. It is not required that you already have a podcast. We're not gonna teach you this week during this workshop how to create a podcast. But we will tell you how a podcast would play a vital role in the growth and marketing of your online community, or the growth of your online community, which help, will help in the growth and marketing of your business. Um, so anyway, it's not required that you have a podcast already, but it is required that you have an understanding of what it is you want to be known for, and what it is that you have to offer the world, and what, you, what your talents are. It's required also that you already have a passion for what it is you want to do. It's required that you have some talent. It doesn't mean that you have to know everything about it. what it is. You can acquire a lot of skills along the way, but you have to have some natural talent for what it is that you want to pursue. Um, also, it's required that you have determination, that you're determined that what you want to do is what you're going to do. Now well, they don't need to come because you're giving them all the information. No, this is what you need to. Th these are the people who should come. Those if you don't, the, okay, yeah. then I spaced for a minute yeah. because I I'm like, wait a minute. No, this something happened. I'm saying and, who should come if you if you like for example if you're like yeah I'd like to have a business but I really don't even know what what I would want to do a business about. This is not the workshop for you. We may do workshops like that down the road. Those would be less expensive than the what we're getting ready okay. to tell you about. What we want are people who already have passion for what they want to do. They're determined that this is what they're going to do. They're going to make it happen. Um, this is somebody who has some self-discipline. And by the way, you don't have to have all the self-discipline. It's also important that if you're married, we strongly encourage that you do not come to this event unless you have the full support of your spouse. Mm -hmm. All right? So th those kind of things. And also, you have to have at least some idea of an economic model already um, but here's the deal. This, this event is going to help you expand your understanding of what's possible with your economic model. So for example, if you think, well, I'm just going to be, I, I want to go into paid public speaking and I want to make a career out of just doing public speaking gigs. Trust me, we're going to help you expand your understanding of what is possible with an online business because public speaking is just going to be one potential stream of income for you. We're going to tell you all the other streams of incomes that that will help naturally help you get that message out there. So it's called Creating an Online Business Around Your Podcast. It's going to be hosted on June 16th and 17th. It's here where we're sitting. Actually, we're off to the side of where we're sitting. You'll get to see our studio in the home that we call what? The house, the house the podcasting built. This is the house that podcasting built. We've had a dream of hosting these events. You have the opportunity, if you're listening right now, uh, as, as we're recording this and publishing this, you have the opportunity to, to be the very first people to walk into the house that podcasting built for our very first workshop on June 16th and 17th. The cost is $9.99. So there is an investment, but if you're creating an online business, we're absolutely certain that if you have all of those things that we talked about, we can help you get a 10x or more return on that over the next year to 18 months. So if you're interested, go to podcastanswerman.com slash next level workshop. So podcastanswerman.com slash next level workshop. It's going to be limited to no more than 10 to 12 people. All right. So you definitely want to get in and register 
as quickly as possible. Stephanie, I can tell that you need to use the restroom very bad, and I apologize for keeping you 44 minutes longer than I had intended. I love you, and I thank you so much for being a partner in this business, and I can't begin to tell you how blessed I am uh, and thankful to God for the fact that I am no longer doing insurance work, but more importantly than that, I am so thankful that for the last 11 and a half years, we've been able to work together in doing something as partners in this thing that God's called us to so many years ago. And I would say today, and I'm going to ask you, God has called me to be in full-time ministry. And today, I have a business and very much involved in full-time ministry, and I believe you are as well. And I believe that this today, where we are now, is what you were called to do. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that, yes. God has called me to be myself, who I am authentically, and to share that with other people. If the definition of that is ministry, then yes, that's what I'm called to do. And there's no doubt from all the feedback we've- 20 years ago, being called to ministry in the- in the box or the mold that they were trying to shove me into was not what God was calling me to do. Exactly. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in to this 500th episode of Podcast Answer Man. And I'm going to go and check this out real quickly here. So this 500th special episode of Podcast Answer Man, Stephanie was correct. This is the 393rd episode of Family from the Heart. And also for this very, very important video that we've created for the homepage of podcastanswerman.com. Thank you so much for tuning in. Stephanie, thank you for everything. And until next time, we encourage everyone to live your life with purpose. Bye-bye. Some man.